Is it All right, we're live. Yep. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I am Nate Ferguson, co-founder of Escarpment Labs. I'm sure you already know who I am. You've seen the, our prior sections. Uh, today, we have Richard Priest, who is also one of the co-founders of Escarpment Laboratories, and who's been moderating all our talks previously. Uh, at Escarpment Labs, Richard is the director of laboratory and research for the labs. When it comes to anything lab-based, he's the guy to, uh, to talk about it. Now, today, we'll be talking about beer flavor diversity. Uh, which focuses really on, around a large experiment we did internally, where we what we kind of called the test ferment experiment, uh, where we compared a large amount of our common strains that we use inside the lab to each other. We did this for a few reasons. The first reason so, was so that we can better understand how these strains relate to each other. You know, not just not just the individual strains themselves, but how they're actually connected and related. And more importantly, which is the second reason, we did this so we can better recommend what strains to our clients so we can better serve them. That was the goal behind this. Now. Rich is going to take it away in a second. Before we get started, I want to mention a few things. Um, we do have a large amount of talks coming up in the near future. This Thursday, we have a whole talk on biotransformation with Richard again. Um, this time next week, however, because of good, uh, sorry, uh, Easter Monday, uh, it'll be, the talk will be on next Tuesday, and that'll be all with, uh, sorry, all regarding Lacto 2.0, which is one of, a, one of the products that we're most excited about in the past year. And that'll actually be with Isabel Neto, and she's uh, one of the chief researchers, researchers who used to work with us. And then this, uh, sorry, next Thursday, we're going to have a full interview with Barncat Ales, uh, very well known for making hazy IPAs. We're just going to be talking hazies. One more thing I want to lay on you guys. The following week from that, we're going to be running a three-day digital conference. Uh, it's going to be three days with about three or four talks each individual day, all the details of which we'll be announcing later on this week. And with that, we're going to get to today's talk. Richard, take it away. Can do. I get to figure out this screen share stuff now. Here we go. All right, you can see my screen now? Excellent. Okay, so yeah, thank you everyone who's here uh, for coming in and uh, expressing some curiosity about uh, yeast flavor diversity. Um, I think, oh, one second here. All right, one of the, one of the last critical steps here. Okay, we're good to go. Um, thanks for expressing interest in yeast flavor diversity. Uh, this was a pretty natural launching point uh, after the yeast basics course that, that Nate presented, um, simply because uh, in the yeast basics course, we were able to get into uh, a lot of the basics of, of how yeast makes flavor, why it makes flavor, how we can control it. Um, and then now we can start to dive into uh, some of the work that we've been doing in our lab and also some of the uh, really cool work that's happening in other yeast labs all over the world um, that's helping us to understand our beer yeast better and ultimately be, be better brewers. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about yeast genetic diversity. I know we introduced that concept a little bit. Um, during the yeast basics course, we're going to talk about how those yeast genetic groups get compared to the product groups as well. I mean, yeast labs, uh, you know, sell uh, lots of different yeast strains. And we're going to try to understand how that maps to what the scientists are doing. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the impact of domestication on the yeast. Um, and then, of course, the meat of this presentation is we're going to go into this big split batch experiment. Um, essentially, really, it's putting... Uh, 50, 50 plus yeast strains head to head in a split batch experiment in a bunch of tiny tubes uh, and then measuring what we get out of it. And we're going to be able to understand the patterns and behavior among different yeast strains and also get to uh, look at some of the uh, interesting outliers as well. So there's some important terms just to go over before we sort of dive deep into this stuff. Um, so we want to talk about uh, just some of the basic sort of genetic terminology that we're going to be using. And, and I may not, you know, go into the nitty gritty details, but it's important to understand these, these key differences. The genotype of, a, of, a, of an organism is the genetic makeup. So that's just the code. That's the ATs, Gs, and Cs, just the genetic code. Um, so just as an example of us using that terminology, Vermont ale, it's genetically an English ale strain. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Uh, but the, the code of that yeast tells us a little bit about what it is. The phenotype is something different. It's, it's the observable characteristics of it. So it's how does it actually behave? What does it actually do? What is it capable of? So for example, Spooky Saison makes phenolic aromas. That's its phenotype. It's able to do that. 
And almost always the genotype leads to the phenotype. Um, and that's really important that the genetic code of the yeast um, partially at least determines how it's going to behave once it's in a given environment. So why does all of this matter? <laughs> There's a lot of strains out there, um, but no one really knows how they compare to each other. You, you go and you try to look for information on one yeast and you're going to get a whole bunch of anecdotes from brewers and, and that information is useful, right? It's good to hear uh, what kind of experiences people have had with different uh, yeast strains and different types of beer. Um, but at the end of the day, those are, those are all anecdotes. And it's really hard to make those direct comparisons um, without actually conducting a scientific experiment. Um, so we have a lot of great anecdotes, but not a, lot of, um, not a lot of hard data. And the problem there is that there's lots of rumors about how these yeasts behave. There's lots of rumors that fly around about you know, which yeast is the best for biotransformation, which one makes the most esters. Um, and so we saw a need to really put that to the test and um, create this multi-strain yeast cage match. Um, so hell between cells instead of hell in a cell. And just circling back to what we learned in Yeast Basics, um, the timeless bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence Yeast by Nate Ferguson. Um, I hope you all uh, got the key points there. Um, we talked about the yeast genetic families in Yeast Basics. We talked about how and why yeast makes flavors. And we talked about how to control those yeast flavors at least to the best of our knowledge, because the reality is that there's still a lot of mysteries here. We still don't know everything there is to know about beer yeasts, and we're still learning. And that, I think that's really exciting. So circling back, we did show this in the Yeast Basics course. Um, this is the, the beer yeast family tree. This is really cool. Um, this is from a study that was uh, carried out by White Labs and in a, in a yeast lab in Belgium as well. Uh, they worked together to sequence a whole bunch of yeasts, uh, the whole genome of the yeasts, and they were able to discover that there was two families of beer yeast from uh, sort of two different lineages or, or ancestral pathways. Um, and that's kind of cool because one of those families, the, the beer two group, was more close to the wine yeast. So they almost have some of these wine-like uh, properties, whereas uh, the majority of the beer strains were in this beer one family, um, and those are the clean yeasts, the ones that are not phenolic, um, the ones that, that we sort of think of as, as being a lot of our workhorse yeasts. Um, and this is really, really cool research, and I want to highlight that because uh, this whole idea of whole genome sequencing, getting all of the genomic data of the yeast is revolutionizing how we are able to work with and develop and understand beer yeast because we have so much more information than we used to have. And it's getting cheaper and cheaper by the day um, to the point where we can sequence a, uh, a yeast and, and get high quality genetic information for two or 300 bucks now, um, where you know that would have cost quite a lot more even five or 10 years ago. So to that end, we were able to make a, a small contribution to that story. Um, we went and sequenced a few Norwegian Kvike strains um, and what we found is that is that it's it's actually a complicated story. Uh, Kvike themselves are actually a hybrid of uh, yeast from two different sort of subfamilies within the family tree. Um, when you go and you look at their genome, so there are some other yeasts like that. These sort of mixed groups are also uh, mixed or mosaics of multiple different yeast histories. Um, we saw a similar story with the Kvikes, where one parent was clearly within. Um, this domesticated beer group. Um, but then another, another parent of the Kvikes is over here in no man's land. And we still don't know exactly what that is yet. Um, but that was interesting in the sense that we found that Kvike yeasts that have all these really cool traits like fast fermentation, uh, heat tolerance, um, also had these really interesting genetic features. Um, and then we sort of wondered, you know, what, um, do those genetic features mean in terms of how the yeast behaves in beer? And we're still trying to understand that. So this is still going. Um, you're not going to be able to see any of this, and it's getting really complicated. And part of that is that there's more and more uh, scientists doing these kinds of studies and sequencing these yeasts. So um, this guy, Christopher Krogeris, he's been assembling the data from all of these different published studies and putting them into one sort of big beer family tree. Uh, to the point where now, now there's too many that you can vi to, to even visualize it easily. But it's really cool because then if we take 
you know, a few, a few sequences from one study and a few sequences from another, we can start to put it all together and really get a good understanding of the evolution of a lot of the, the brewing yeast that exist out there now. So we can even zoom into some of these families, we can enhance. Um, so for example, one of the things we did was plug the Vermont ale strain into this tree because uh, we had that uh, strain of ours genome sequenced and found that it, it, uh, it landed in the Fuller's family. A lot of these other yeasts are allegedly um, from, from the Fuller's family of yeasts. Um, and, and that was surprising because it was, it was rumored that, that Vermont was um, closer to sort of the Ringwood family of English strains. But when you look at the genetics, that, that seems to maybe not be the case. So this also allows us to do that kind of uh, genetic detective work and really understand what these things are. Um, it may even force um, us yeast labs to be a little bit more transparent about where things are coming from when uh, this data becomes so easy to access. So how do yeast labs group their strains? Yeast labs typically group their strains into either a region of origin or a beer style. So for example, it might, it might be a, a Belgian yeast or an English yeast or an American yeast, or they might group it according to the beer style. Like this is our IPA yeast, this is our Hefeweizen yeast, etc. cetera. Um, at Escarpment Labs, we do take a bit of a hybrid approach here. We do try to respect the genetic groups as much as we can, um, but we also try to help guide people to the right strain for the right style. So for example, Vermont Ale is genetically an English strain, but it does work really well for American hazy IPAs and a lot of American beer styles. And so we tend to group that in the American uh, strains. So just to sort of go over how we have categorized our strains, um, we, we have this hybrid approach where some of it is geographic, right? We have American, Belgian, British, and German strains, but then we also get into style-specific things like lager, saison, bison, and then we also have some of these, uh, you know, interesting things like the wild-derived yeasts, as well as the, the kvike, which we know are sort of a mysterious ancestry, and then also what we're calling landrace yeast. So these are uh, farmhouse brewing yeasts that are, that are not kvike, but come from similar traditions of yeast being reused for, for farmhouse brewing. So in this study, we were able to include uh, two from Norway and uh, two from Russia. And uh, Lars Marius Garshall, the, you know, the Kvik god, um, he, he recently, just yesterday, released an article um, that talks about these two. So if you want to learn more about uh, some of these um, more oddball Norwegian yeasts, you can head over to Lars' blog. So what are the missing pieces? There hasn't really been a published study comparing dozens of beer yeast and fermentations. This is what I was talking about, how there's tons and tons of anecdotes, but not a lot of data out there. Um, so a lot of anic data out there. Um, and, and then the other problem, and that's not something we're going to get to here, but that we're hoping to get to in the future, is that the beer fermentation traits, you know, the flavors and the behaviors that yeast make in beer haven't been linked back to the genome on mass. So like no one's gone and taken 40 plus beer yeasts and tried to understand um, how the traits of those beer yeasts links back to um, all of the genetic data of those yeasts. So hopefully that's something we can we can help out with in the future. And ultimately, you know, we are we are a business that makes yeast and, and helps people with their fermentations and understanding our yeast helps us to help our clients. And this also opens the door for us to enhance existing traits. If we know exactly the right conditions for fermenting the Arden strain, we can tell you that and then you can be able to hit your target when you need to. Or understanding these traits allows us to select yeasts to breed or to blend to enhance flavors or create new ones. So here's, here's one example of this kind of thing that's been done. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details here because this like, literally looks like static. Um, but this is also from that, that awesome um, uh, paper with White Labs in the Belgian lab. And what they did is they, they characterized a bunch of yeasts according to their response to different uh, uh, stressors, for example. Uh, environmental stress, nutrient stress. But what they also did is they looked at the aroma production. So they took all of these yeasts and looked at, you know, which aroma compounds are they making? How much are they making it? And then they tried to cluster those yeasts according to those traits. And, and that's really cool because this is something we can use to, you know, to take data, uh, and data doesn't lie usually, um, to create yeast families independent of 
the stories that have sort of come behind those yeasts. Because in some cases, we sort of suspect that, you know, maybe some of these stories are wrong. Like we've seen some evidence that maybe some of the uh, Belgian strains might actually be English in origin and vice versa, right? So we can start to tease that apart, even just by looking at the behavior of the yeast. So we couldn't go into this level of detail for our own study. Um, we, uh, this is accomplished using, using a robot and a lot of sophisticated technology. Uh, we don't have a robot, but we do have people. And we have good people. Um, so these are the people behind the great test ferment experiment. Uh, this project was spearheaded by Isabel Neto, and you'll, you'll hear a talk from her next week as well. Um, she's not working with us anymore, but while she was with us, she, she really helped us with a lot of our um, challenging research projects um, and definitely spearheaded this project, and, but was also assisted by a number of people from our lab. Um, so McKenna Tosh, Shelby Stein, Chris Saunders, and Alex Mitro. And then we also had some help from our collaborators at University of Guelph to um, do some of the analysis. So <laughs> what's the experiment? What were we, what were we doing? Um, and this is kind of fun because this is this is our miniature fermenter. This is how we're able to uh, test tons and tons of different yeast on mass. So we created these uh, little fermenters um, in 50 milliliter centrifuge tubes. So you know those of you who work in labs probably you know have seen these things all day, but if you don't, it's these little sort of plastic tubes with a blue cap. Um, they're super cheap. Um, they come sterile. They're you know really really handy tools for setting up miniature fermentations. And we can fit those with an airlock, and it becomes a, a pretty good little model conical beer fermenter. Um, so for our study, we, we were able to use those, and, and that meant that we could run our experiment um, in a small incubator. Whereas, you know, otherwise, if you're taking 50 yeast strains and you're and you're <laughs> trying to run fermentations on them, if you're doing this in carboys, all of a sudden you're you filled a warehouse, right? So we couldn't do that. We had to scale it down. Um, we did we did uh we did have to sort of make some choices as to how the yeast get handled um so not everything was at the exact same temperature and pitch rate um, and that's just something to flag right at the start uh the ale strains were all fermented at 20 celsius the lager strains were all fermented at 15 celsius so sort of optimal temperatures for those categories um just in general it's really hard when we have a group of yeast that includes you know saison yeast and and kolsch yeast to try to find an optimal temperature but we did our best. And then pitch rate did depend too. So um, we did all of our, you know, what we call standard yeast, clean yeast at 10 million cells per mil. And uh, we do typically recommend brewers pitch Belgian wild and bison yeast at a lower pitch rate. So that is what we chose for this study as well. Um, it was a pretty standard wort that we used. That was sort of the goal is try to make it as generic as possible, um, but still with a good nutrient supply. And then we measured we measured and we measured. We measured everything that we could out of these little fermenters. Uh, so we measured specific gravity to get the fermentations. And we measured pH, viability, fan, IBUs, uh, sugars, alcohols, and then as many aroma compounds as we could as well. So uh, a really huge amount of data collection. And it takes a long time. We tested 73 strains. Uh, some of those were private. Um, so we're going to share data on on... 58 of them. This was nine months total of work. Uh, a lot of that was troubleshooting up front to get the methods working so that we could repeat it every single time um, because that's really important. If we're doing an experiment that takes that long, we need to make sure that there's consistency between um, runs of that experiment. Uh, so it's it's not trivial. It's a lot of work. Um, at the end, we ended up with <laughs> thousands and thousands of data points, you know, many of which were collected manually. And uh, I think it's definitely commendable that the, the team was able to get that done because uh, we've learned a lot about our yeasts through doing this. So this is what the fermentation curves look like. And this is, you know, why I want to explain to you that we, uh, it's going to be really hard to take a bird's eye view of a lot of the information because there's, there's just a lot of data there. Um, really hard to go into the details. So what we're going to do uh, in the next little bit is we're going to sort of do a deep dive into certain interesting traits. We're going to ask specific questions about the data and try to find specific answers and, and see, see what pops up and see what's interesting, because otherwise it's too overwhelming. It's hard to really get much uh, meaning from all of these little tiny fermentation curves. So we can ask simple questions and, and, and dig for answers. So one of the questions we can ask is, which strain was the fastest? Um, those of you in the comments on the right hand side, I'll, I'll give you like maybe 20, 30 seconds and, and you, you tell me, what do you think was the fastest? 
And um, keep in mind that this was fermentation at 20 degrees Celsius, right? So not necessarily super warm. Um, different yeasts perform better at different temperatures, right? <laughs> Kvike, I see, is one of the answers. Mexican lager. I think I think the Mexican lager is is maybe not going to play out to be correct, but um, maybe you were right about Kvike. I don't know. So. This is this is what it, what it looks like. Um, we're going to sort of look at at the data as as these yeast groups, and then we're going to dive dive in and look at individual strains. Um, so if we look at these charts, for example, we we've separated based on uh, the strain categories. So only only yeasts that are within this category um, show up colored, and then we also see all of the yeasts as this gray spectrum in the background. And then in this graph, uh, what we're seeing is that the yeast on the left-hand side are the fast ones. These are the ones that have dropped the specific gravity the most within 48 hours of fermentation. The ones on the right-hand side are the slowest, so they've dropped the specific gravity the least. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, even though our fermentations were only 20 degrees Celsius, the quikes still did really well. Um, and that's kind of awesome because we haven't, uh, we haven't put quikes to the test against uh, quote unquote normal yeasts um, at temperatures this cold before. And it's really cool to see them still dominating um, the field. Um, predictably, the lager yeasts were some of the slower ones. You see some of the highest uh, specific gravities or the, low, the longest leg phases. Um, part of that is also because they were fermented at 15 Celsius, so fairly cold. Um, and then you, you do see a pretty widespread, like for example, some of the Belgian strains are really fast. Some of the Belgian strains are, are really slow. Um, interestingly enough, you know, one of the things that should pop out here is that uh, one of the Belgian strains beat the Kvikes. Crazy. What was that? So we see that down here. Uh, our classic wit beer at 20 Celsius actually beat out the next Kvike, which was our Lairdal. Um, so across the board, the top performers in terms of fermentation rate were the Kvikes, uh, some of these land races too. So Marina, uh, Marina from Russia did very, very well. Um, and then we see some of the other Belgian strains, another wit strain uh, fermenting quite fast. Um, so more or less what we would expect. I think the, uh, the classic wit results beating the Kvike is, is a bit of a surprise, bit of, bit of a, you know, surprise upset. Um, and then also predictably the, the loggers are the slow fermenters. Uh, I would almost expect uh, Czech lager and Mexican lager to be to be. Uh, they are they are definitely not not the speediest strains in the world, but they do make really tasty beers. Um, and the other thing is that up here in in the uh, slow fermenter land, we see a lot of the diastatic strains. And we talked about this a little bit. We're going to talk about this more in the future. But um, diastatic uh, yeast strains consume sugars in a very different way. They, they, they try to break down a lot of the stuff that's outside the cell um, before fermenting it, as opposed to most normal yeast strains, which bring in a lot of those sugars. So they use a different mechanism to ferment, and that can result in them fermenting at the start anyway, a little bit slower. Which one had the lowest FG? Which one made the driest beer? And I think we can, we can all guess um, which group of strains might have fit into that category. Um, and I think we might see that play out here. So we see some patterns emerging here. Uh, the left-hand side, we can see uh, the strains that have the lowest final gravity, so the strains that have fermented the most of the sugar. And then on the right-hand side, we can see the strains that have fermented the least of the sugar um, and left uh, a sweeter beer. Um, so we can see uh, lower final gravity in a lot of the Saison strains, which makes sense, right? We pick Saison strains because they make a dry beer and ferment all of the sugars typically, right? Um, and then if we go and we look at the land race yeasts, some of these uh, may not be as well adapted to uh, consuming the malt sugars as, as maybe some of our more industrial or more domesticated yeasts. And so consequently, we, we don't see them consuming as much of the sugars. Um, likewise, lager yeasts are, are pretty well known to not be super attenuative and um, maybe not as well known, but something that I think is always important to mention is that Kvike yeasts, they ferment really fast, but they don't, they don't ferment super dry a lot of the time. So they tend to be sort of in the, in the bottom half of this spectrum. In terms of final gravity, um, well, we saw this before. Um, we'll see it down here. Our top performers, by and large, are our diastatic strains. So 
you know, French Saison is kind of the gold standard for aggressive, super low final gravity in beers. Um, our dry Belgian did a little bit better here, but you know, by and large, you see all of the Saison strains um, punching above their weight here and really drying up the beers, um, as well as Rima, an another one of the Rima strains. So um, some interesting stuff coming from these yeasts from Russia. In terms of the weak performers, we see um, some of these strains from um, inland Norway, Skrindo and Halversgard, as well as the other Rima uh, Russian strain. So some really interesting sort of extremes going on with a lot of these uh, land race farmhouse brewing yeasts. Um, and that's interesting because it, it means that they may have, uh, they may be unique um, in terms of their behavior as compared to a lot of our typical yeasts. And, you know, as a yeast lab, we're always looking for something that's, that's uh, new or interesting. Um, one thing I would, yeah, mention is again, loggers and kvikes are, are, are often on the lower spectrum when it comes to attenuation. So if you're trying to make a beer that's drier with those, with, with both loggers or kvikes, I would recommend make a fermentable wort. Um, I'm a big fan of step mashes. You don't have to step mash, but I would recommend uh, try to make a fermentable wort whenever you can when you're brewing with those if you're trying to make a dry beer. Um, and, and that can really, really help with uh, flavor balance with, with both lager yeast and with kvikes. Which ones drop pH? Um, this feels like a hot topic now. Um, we see people talking about this a lot more, um, especially when it comes to lagers and when it comes to hazy IPAs. Um, the reason for this is with, with lagers, uh, lager yeast tend to not drop pH very much. And this is something Nate talked about in the yeast basics, or at least in the Q&A. And so consequently, if you're brewing a lager wort, you typically make it pretty acidic, like pH 5 to 5.2, because the yeast isn't going to drop it that much. And so you need some of that wort acidity to make the beer nice and crisp and balanced. But some yeasts may drop the pH so much that the flavor becomes harsh or even noticeably acidic. So that's really important with lagers is to, is to really dial that in. It's also really important for hazy IPAs because the haze forming particles, the proteins and polyphenols, they, they may have, uh, I'm not sure if there's actually solid evidence on this, but they may have, there's, there's suggestion that they have pH optimum and that if the pH is too low, too high, that can um, cause some issues with haze stability. And, and I know that a lot of the, the commercial breweries uh, struggle with haze stability. So that's always something that I, I ask people to look into is, you know, what was your starting pH, your wort pH? What was your beer pH? Were there differences between the hazy batch and the non-hazy batch? And, and sometimes there is, and, and that's uh, an important thing to look at. So if we look at the pH uh, spectrum, again, here at, at the low end, these are the yeasts that are dropping the pH the most, um, they're making the most acidic beer. And then up, up here, these are the yeast that are dropping the pH the least. They're making the least acidic beer, the softest beer. Uh, we see across the board, uh, Kvikes, Saisons, and the Wild Strains are, are the ones that are um, dropping pH um, the most. Um, and then if we look on the other end of the spectrum, we see pretty uniformly the British strains and the Lager strains are dropping the pH the least. So they're making softer beers. And I think this is really important because I know that a lot of people are now uh, making lager-like beers and hazy IPAs with Kvike. And, and this is actually a key difference. You know, uh, hazy IPAs are almost always made with British strains. Lagers are almost always made with lager strains. If you're making either of these beer styles with Kvike, you may need to adjust your wort pH to get to the right final pH to make that beer style and make it balanced, where sometimes people run into IPAs that are that are more harsh and astringent than intended or lagers that are more acidic than intended. And, and a big part of that is this pH gap. So who's dropping it the most? Um, in this experiment, it was, uh, once again, we see at the extremes, these land race yeasts, the Halversgard um, from inland Norway. And then also a lot of the Saison strains and wild strains um, with Kvikes as well here below 4.2. And once again, the ones that are dropping the pH the least are the English strains as well as the lager strains. So we can see here, English Yale 2, Foggy London. Um, this is sort of the gold standard for hazy IPAs. Um, that's the one that is um, one of the ones that's dropping the pH the least. So if you're taking a recipe that's meant for this yeast, but then you're plugging in Evergarden, which is, which is an awesome strain for you know, these mango guava aromas in a hazy IPA, you really need to watch that pH gap because this is a pretty big difference in acidity. So 
if you're making a, a hazy IP with, with Epigarden, you know that it's going to drop the pH more. So you may need to have a higher starting wort pH or more buffering capacity in that wort to create the same flavor balance without it becoming too harsh. How much fan do they consume? Uh, <laughs> I had some fun making this. Uh, this is Hungry Hungry Yeasties. Um, give them a plate of food, see which ones consume the most. Um, and this was kind of interesting to us. This is not what we expected. So what we see here um, on the right-hand side is, is the strains that consume the most of the fan. And recall that the fan in our wort was, was about 230 ppm. So regardless of the yeast, we were giving them enough. You know, Thankfully, we weren't um we weren't starving any of our yeast like we'd never do that right um but interestingly enough the the belgians were the ones um a lot of the belgians were the ones consuming the most fan which um is not what we expected we, we sort of had a had a hypothesis or a theory that that kvike was the most um nutrient hungry uh in terms of fan but that that didn't seem to be the case that being said we still see a lot of patterns emerge right we see a cluster of Belgians are super nutrient hungry. We do, we do see some of the kvikes do have uh, higher than average nutrient requirements. And then um, the lager yeasts are, are all, you know, um, not very not very heavy eaters. Um, they tend to use a lot less of the fan in the wort. And that's really important, um, especially when we consider that a lot of the work that's been done on yeast nutrition in beer has been done with these lager strains. And so it's possible that some of the recommendations, you know, really need to be um, need to take these these yeasts with higher nutrient requirements into considerations, right? Where if you're making a even a 1040, 1050 wort with pale malt, you might not be supplying enough nutrients for these yeasts, but yeah, you definitely are with these yeasts. So that's something to watch out for. So our hungriest yeast are Belgians mostly. So a dry Belgian, St. Remy, Fruity Wit, um, they're all consuming quite a lot of nutrient. And if you consider that, that Belgian brewers are almost always doing step mashes and all of these things to really extract everything they possibly can from the grain, then, you know, it starts to make sense in terms of how, how the yeast behave. Um, and, you know, on the other hand of the, of the spectrum, the lager yeast that, that might be, you know, exposed to a lot of these, you know, lower gravity warts and Pilsner malts and things like that, um, also genetically totally different, um, being a, a hybrid of two different species, um, they're, they're consuming a lot less. They're very careful eaters. And we also see that with some of the American strains. So Cali Ale, for example, that's a strain where I don't think I've ever had um, any issues with with that strain and nutrients. It's it's really flexible when it comes to nutrient supply. And that's part of why um, a lot of breweries uh, use this strain as sort of a workhorse option. It's just really easy to work with. Do they reduce IBU? This is one of my favorite things to talk about because I'm not sure how well known this is. Um, yeast strains do reduce IBU, you know, I can't tell you how many times brewers have sent in beer for testing and they've been very confused by, by the number that comes back for their IBUs uh, because it's way lower than they, they thought it was from their calculators. They immediately point to the brew house and say, you know, there's something going on here with my efficiency. And, you know, we have to say, send us the wort. And, and more often than not, the wort is spot on. The beer has a reduced IBU. And that is because yeast actually does strip some IBU from the beer. So this isn't very well understood, um, but there are some theories that, that yeast will actually bind to some of those bitter compounds like isoalpha acid. And then when they flocculate, they may pull it out of solution, um, thereby reducing the, the soluble um, bittering compounds in the beer and reducing the IBUs. Uh, credit where credit is due. Um, I did see uh, White Labs talking about this um, a number of years ago, and then they had some presentations about different yeasts uh, reducing IBUs. Um, as far as I can tell, nothing's been published on this topic, but I uh, did want to flag that 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 there are other people interested in 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 this phenomenon, and and so are we. So just to mention that our wort started at 35 IBU. So anything we see down here is a reduction in the IBUs from our original beer. And uh, once again, we see some some trends with our with our yeast categories. So over here we see. There's some British strains that are reducing the, the IBUs in the beer very significantly, right? We're down near 20 from 35. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we see 
um, for some of the saison strains, they're they're not touching the IBU very much. Uh, they're leaving the bitterness intact, and that maybe that's because they're flocculating less. Um, same thing with the lagers. We see some of those lagers are leaving uh, the IBU of the beer virtually untouched. So who is the biggest uh, IBU dropper? And uh, the answer is that was Ringwood and and also our, our recently launched English Ale 3. So if we look at those two, we see an almost 43% reduction in IBU. So that that's really important for brewers. This is another, another um, graph that I think is really important in helping people um, plug and play one yeast uh, strain into another yeast strain's recipe, right? If, if I've made a, a lager with Copenhagen lager, and then I take that same recipe and I use Isar lager, well, we've got a big difference in IBUs. That Copenhagen beer is going to taste a lot more bitter than that Isar beer, and we're going to have to make adjustments in our other ingredients to match that flavor balance. But having this information, we can start to predict that and, and avoid any of those um, unbalanced uh, beers. So this is really useful, I think. In terms of the strains that don't touch the IBUs, we do see the Copenhagen lager is, you know, one one example that really didn't touch them at all. Um, same thing with uh, uh, Munich lager. Um, some of the saison strains as well. They really don't touch touch the bitterness. And you know, I can tell you if you taste a uh, if you make a, a saison at like 35, 40 IBU and taste it a week or two in, it's it's pretty darn bitter. And um, and and yeah, those those yeasts are leaving that stuff pretty pretty much untouched. Um, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can take a pretty pretty hoppy beer with some of these yeasts, like you know Hornendal or Ringwood, and 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 you know if you're not careful, it'll reduce your bitterness to to nothing and and, and make the beer um, sweeter than you intend. So th this is really important, I think, in nailing that flavor balance. Uh, one thing to mention is that the yeasts that are being used for a lot of the hazy IPAs uh, tend to also be the the heavier IBU reducers. So Vermont Ale, Foggy London Ale. Um, Horn and Dahl like things like that, um, are also reducing IBU a fair bit. So there does seem to be some selection by the brewers already for these traits. Um, and that, that's not to say that you can't use some of these yeast for these kinds of beers, but that, say, if I were to make a hazy IPA with Cerberus, I may need to use um, less, less bittering to get the same flavor balance and the same juiciness as compared to the same uh, beer that was fermented with Vermont. So I think that's really important in helping people to to dial in their flavors. Who makes the most glycerol? I get this question a lot. I, I get brewers emailing me um, asking, you know, how do I get more glycerol in my beer? How do I get more uh, mouthfeel? How do I get more body in my beer from the yeast? And usually the answer I give is that there's there's a lot of easier ways to get body in your beer than to try to crank up the glycerol production from the yeast. Um, but there are some differences, and it is important. Glycerol is made as a byproduct of the fermentation. You know, not all of the sugar is turned into alcohol. Some of it gets turned into glycerol um, and acetic acid. Um, so it's a natural byproduct of the fermentation, and it does contribute to body and the perception of sweetness of beer. Um, I, one, one key difference, if, you have, if you've had a, a Brett primary beer, for example, Brett doesn't make glycerol, so it tends to make the beer very, very thin um, tasting. And... Part of that difference is the fact that there's no glycerol. Um, and so that's always a good experiment. If, if you haven't done a Brett primary, try it out because you'll probably experience that um, some of that body is missing and needs to be compensated for other ways um, through things like oats. So what do we see in terms of the trends? We do see, you know, not a huge trend according to family. We see a lot of these families are, are all over the place. Um, we do see with the loggers, they're typically low glycerol producers. Um, you know, this is going to be a trend everywhere is that loggers don't do a lot. And that's what we love about logger strains is that they, uh, they sort of get out of the way. Um, but we do see, you know, some of the Saison yeast, some of the Kvike yeasts, some of the Belgian yeasts, um, being heavier glycerol producers. Um, and that's interesting because then maybe those strains could be selected to, um, enhance the body and, and mouthfeel of a beer. So who makes the most? Um, we see our farm stand saison. So that's another strain that we just released as a as a limited edition. Um, depending on on how how people like that strain, we'll we'll look at making that regularly available. Um, we also see the dry Belgian strain. Uh, interestingly enough, we see the the Hornendal Kvike, uh, number three 
um, also really heavy, heavy glycerol producer. So if you're looking to make a beer with, with enhanced body, um, that's a great option. I know that people are using it for hazy IPAs, even, even for clean, clean beers as well. Um, if you look at the low glycerol producers, that's pretty dominated by, by lager strains. Um, uh, but it's, one thing I thought was interesting here is that you also see, uh, the two Chico yeasts here at the very bottom, Cali Ale, Anchorman Ale, um, yeasts that are known to make, you know, these really nice, dry, crisp, you know, uh, West coast American IPAs, um, interestingly enough, are also, um, not producing very much in the way of glycerol. Um, so that, that's interesting that, that maybe uh, the glycerol production of the strain contributes to its overall flavor profile. Um, although we're not, we're not quite there with this, with this yet. Um, we'd have to follow up with some sensory studies. So I hinted at this earlier, but yeast also does make acetic acid. And this is something that Nate discussed in uh, Yeast Basics as well. Um, it's one, one of the other byproducts of metabolism where you have, you know, production of, of, of ethanol can go the other way and some acetic acid can exit the cell. Um, it is a natural metabolite within the yeast. Uh, they don't make nearly as much as, for example, acetobacter or even lactobacillus, but they do make some acetic acid and we can measure it. So we did. Uh, and that might contribute to some of these pH gaps as well. So if we, if we look at the spectrum here uh, on the left-hand side where our acetic acid is low or the right-hand side where our acetic acid is high, we see that consistently the American ale strains are all quite low acetic acid producers. Same thing with the, Brit the British ale strains. Um, if we go and we look at the Belgians and Kvikes and Saisons in the wilds, we see higher acetic acid production. Um, and there does seem to be some trends um, associated with the yeast families here. Uh, one thing that's important to mention is that these are really small quantities like sour beers can have 50 times this much. Um, and that's not even like an extreme sour beer. So, um, yes, yeast makes acetic acid, but it's not really a, you know, huge or noticeable quantity. Who's making the most, uh, it's mostly the Saison strains and the wild strains. So here are uh, Scotia Sauvage, uh, wild yeast from, uh, Cape Breton Island, uh, in the very east of Canada. Um, producing a lot of acetic acid, um, farm stand saison, French saison, Ontario farmhouse. Really, uh, really, it's a barn party out here. Um, and then as we get closer to the uh, low end of the spectrum, we see a lot of those uh, American ale strains and uh, British ale strains that are they're not producing very much acetic acid. Again, you know, this is not really perceptible, but it, it may have uh, slight impacts on, on on other things like pH. We can also measure the, uh, the fusels or the volatile alcohols. And once again, these are things that are just produced as a byproduct of the yeast fermentation. So um, at, in the process of breaking down amino acids, um, making, making alcohol, um, we have the yeast producing fusel alcohols, and um, that is uh, measurable. And uh, of course, if there's too much of this, this is a problem because these are uh, typically perceived as off flavors. And so... Um, a yeast that is you know, predisposed to producing a lot of fusels, um, you know, may not be the best flavor wise. So if we look at the trends, we see, we see some, um, trends with the groups. So on the low end of the spectrum, we see that the lager yeast, so uh, once again, the lager yeast are not doing much. Um, and on the high end of the spectrum, we see some of the British strains, some of the Saison strains, um, one of the American strains, um, producing, um, above average amounts of these um, fusels or volatile alcohols. So who produced the most? Um, it does seem like in this study, the American ale and Burton ale strains produced the most. Um, not sure if that's because of the experimental conditions. I, I would never recommend, you know, in an ordinary day, fermenting your beer in a, in a 50 milliliter plastic tube. It's not very efficient. So that could have something to do with the vessel, um, or it could be a natural trait of the yeast. Um, Worth, uh, worth, worth mentioning either way. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting because Nate discussed this in the yeast basics. Um, he talked about the difference between, you know, Belgian triples and, and English barley wines where you, you, you there's, these are both high, high, um, alcohol beers, but you often get more fusels from the, the English beers. And, 
what I thought was interesting here is that the English strains are also the ones that are producing more of those volatile alcohols, as opposed to the Belgian strains, which are which are typically low producers of, of fusels. So, um, including the, the the types of malt uh, and the, the amounts of, of uh, amino acids that go into the beer, the actual yeast selection may also impact the um, amount of fusels that you get in in a in a high gravity beer. So we can go to our acetate esters. I just love this picture on the right-hand side. I, I'm so glad that that got included in the yeast basics. Um, it's just such a good uh, demonstration of of, uh, of really the real-world implications of yeast flavor, right? That if yeast make these aroma compounds, they attract flies, and and that may be a you know a reason that yeast are getting around in the wild because you know yeast don't have wings, so they need to come up with clever ways to get around. Um, so we can measure these things, the acetate esters, and so three of the key ones are. Um, isoamyl acetate or banana, the ethyl acetate, our sort of pear uh, solventy kind of flavor, and phenethyl acetate, which is our floral uh, rose flavor. So if we look at that, um, we can also see some trends here. So if we look at our wild yeasts and our Belgian yeasts and our Saison yeasts, those are, those are the ones that are producing high quantities of the acetate esters. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we see, once again, the loggers are low. Um, pretty interesting. We do see some variation in some of these families. Like for example, the British strains are all over the place. Uh, the German strains are all over the place. So there is definitely some variation, um, within the families. And that may speak to the fact that the genetics that underlie ester production are, are always, uh, complicated and, and, uh, we still don't fully understand all of it. So who's the banana bomb? I'm I'm so happy about this result because uh, this is this was one of my predictions, uh, and it came true. Ontario Farmhouse Ale uh, was the heaviest producer of the acetate esters, especially the isoamyl acetate banana. Um, that's a strain um, that we combine with with Brett to sort of keep that banana in check. Um, but it's it's always uh, you know really crazy using that yeast, and um, you know three or four days in, like mid ferment, you smell it, and it's like intensely um, banana, like it fills the room. Um, so I was happy to see that, that that played out in the in the actual science as well. Um, and in general, we see we see a lot of um, Belgian strains up here, Saison strains. Um, interestingly enough, the Ringwood strain um, producing a lot of these acetate esters up here. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we see a lot of English strains and American strains as well as the loggers. So the Foggy London, um, English Ale 1, Cali Ale, not very flavor active in these um, banana, pear, rose, esters. Uh, fatty acid esters. So this is um, sort of the class of, of um, esters that are that are results of of a fatty acid um, combining with with alcohol with ethanol. Um, so the three that we look at, or well, actually, there's a fourth. Um, we're looking at at like ethyl caproate, ethyl caprolate, and ethyl decanoate. Uh, as well as ethyl nonanoate, that's another one. Um, these are sort of characterized by having what we kind of generically call orchard fruit aromas, but you can get more specific. Like, I think that ethyl caprolate smells like pineapple. I think that ethyl caprolate smells like apple. Um, ethyl nonanoate, which is which is the one that I didn't list here, that kind of smells like I don't know, like some kind of tutti frutti gum kind of thing. It's probably used in in synthetic flavors all the time. Um, they just sort of have these these uh, strong fruity aromas, and and they're they're different from the the acetate esters. So what we see with these is that there's a pretty wide distribution in the groups. These esters are the ones that are almost the hardest to explain genetically. Like it's still really poorly understood how these are produced and how you can control and enhance the production of of the fatty acid esters. So. Um, it makes sense to me that we see a really wide distribution, like within the British strains, we see, you know, some of these strains are among the lowest producers and some of these strains or one of these strains is the highest producer of these, um, of these, uh, fatty acid esters. Uh, once again, the loggers are mostly low, but there's one exception. Um, and we see the Saison's likes, um, punching above their weight aromatically in some cases. So who's the fruitiest? Um, in this case, it was English Ale 2, so another one of our English strains. Um, also the Saison Maison, um, pretty flavor active in these 
uh, orchard fruit, uh, tropical fruit aromas, uh, Munich lager, weirdly enough, um, maybe at 15 Celsius in a plastic tube, it gets really fruity. Not so sure. Uh, once and once again, ringwood. So that that's one that comes out as as an English strain that is actually quite strongly fruity, um, and we thought that was interesting um, because it's not a strain that we've worked with um, super extensively, but but it is one with a with a pretty interesting history. Uh, Foggy London Horn and uh, two strains that are that are used for uh, for uh, fruity beers, especially for hazy IPAs. Um, also producing a lot of these and these uh, pineapple. Orchard fruit aromas can support some of the aroma from some of those like New World fruity hops. Um, interestingly enough, Caliel also shows up here. I, I know you know if you have Cali on its own, sometimes you can get these sort of uh, pineapple or peachy aromas. So it does make sense to see that show up there as well. Um, on the low end of the spectrum, we see our American Ale and Burton Ale. So those are the same strains that were producing a lot of the uh, volatile alcohols. Um, also producing a low amount of the, the fatty acid esters. Um, I thought it was interesting that some of the Saison strains are actually lower producers in these. And I, and I would say that, that you know, this, this makes sense just in terms of our experience. Um, that New World sack, that New World Saison strain, um, that one's normally paired with two Brett strains that are, that are super aromatic. So they kind of do the aromatic heavy lifting where that Saison strain really just helps to get that um, peppery note in there. So to me, this makes sense, but yeah, it's interesting to see the Saison strains kind of across the whole spectrum. So if you're looking for a neutral Saison strain, that's the one to go with. If you're looking for something super fruity, you might want the, the Maison um, or, or the Old World or Spooky. So we can also measure the fatty acids. So those are the precursors to those uh, fatty acid esters. You know, it has to start with these acids first. Um, these are often described as, as you know, especially caprylic acid, described as like goaty or goat cheesy. Um, in other ways, you know, described as dairy-like. Um, these are all things that are found in milk, for example, in milk products like cheese. So it makes sense that we perceive them that way. Um, I would say, yeah, depending on the compound, they can smell cheesy or just kind of like milk. Um, but they are they are flavors that are made by yeast um, and, and that are key flavors in, in the yeasts that we use in beer. So there's a pretty wide dis distribution for the fatty acids in most of the groups. So once again, you know, maybe this is just like with the fatty acid esters, it seems like the fatty acid production itself is, is probably um, pretty complex in the sense that we don't see um, strong trends associated with these, with these strain groups. Um, once again, it's low in the loggers. Um, we look on the right-hand side, we can see some of these land race yeasts, or at least one of these is producing a, a pretty large amount of these fatty acids. Uh, and then also some of the Kvike strains, which are which are known to have some of these sort of dairy-like characteristics, um, also do punch above their weight. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that that um, there's a widespread here, but the, the values in general are fairly low. If we were to put a Brett strain or two in this study, it would be like up here somewhere. Um, so different strains, uh, different species of yeast do have different characteristics, and Brett is. Um, certainly uh, quite a lot, uh, can be quite a lot cheesier, goatier, funkier than uh, a lot of these uh, Saccharomyces yeasts. So who's making a lot of the, the fatty acids? Uh, we see Rima too. So again, one of these sort of oddball uh, Russian farmhouse yeasts. Um, Burton Ale just seems to be all over the place. Um, and then also some of the Kvikes. So this is something that, that has been, I think, discussed in a lot of brewing circles is that um, Kvike can make these sort of dairy-like, uh, milk-like aromas. And that probably is these um, volatile fatty acids that people are detecting. And um, in the right beer, that, that's, that's a good thing. But if, it's, if, if, if all you're getting is the fatty acids and you're not getting the esters, then it can be kind of unpleasant. So um, it is important to have that flavor balance. Um, what we've seen in general is with the Kvikes, if, uh, if, if the pitching rate is too high and the temperature is too low, like if you try to pitch like lager pitching rates at lager temperatures, you might get a little bit more of this than you want, but otherwise it's, it's not super noticeable. And, and especially when it comes to like, um, using aroma hops, um, like modern American hops, um, some of that sort of milky characteristic can really help to enhance like the tropical fruit flavors. Um, of, of those hops. So it's not always a bad thing. And then of course our lagers are low. They don't make a whole lot of anything and that's why we love them. Whew. So that was a lot of data. Um, 
there's uh, a lot here, a lot to digest. I, I hope you guys are, are digesting. And if there are any questions or anything that needs clarification, um, please ask a question um, in the questions panel and, and we'll try our best to answer that. Um, I know that there's really a lot of information that I'm throwing at you and a lot of this or all of this is brand new. And um, I think this will all be useful in the future to help, uh, help people dial in um, their fermentations and get the most out of their yeast. But, we now have this data and we can we can start asking interesting questions about everything as a whole, as opposed to sort of dissecting this and looking at individual traits. What we can do is we can we can look at all of the data as a whole and and um, and, and see what that tells us. So one of the questions we can ask is. Do our strain groups make sense? Um, so, you know, as I explained earlier, we have strain groups that in some cases are geographical in other cases are um are according to um style like hefeweizen for example um and the question we asked was like does it make sense or have we misclassified some of our yeast like does one of our belgian strains actually look more like an english strain for example so this is going to look this is going to look like a lot i'm going to walk you through this um what we can do is we can start to use we start to use fancy math to uh, to try to to try to look for these patterns. So what we've done here is we've made a heat map. So in all of these little squares, we've we've sort of turned uh, the number into a color. So uh, red means there's a lot of it. Blue means there's not very much of it at all. And uh, white is its average. Um, so we have that heat map. And what we can do is we can also take that data and um, cluster it. So we can take uh, we can look at the overall profile here and then put strains that have similar profiles next to each other. So say, for example, um, these lager strains, they're all quite similar to each other. And we know this, right? Lager strains are typically not super expressive. And so consequently, if we plug a bunch of lager strains um, into a group that also contains Cezanne yeasts and British yeasts and Kvikes, uh, the lagers are probably going to cluster together. And that's what we saw. Something we thought was really interesting here is that uh, we actually were able to reproduce that sort of big split in um, the beer yeasts, where uh, the strains that fall into the beer one group, or that we assume fall into the beer one group until we sequence them, um, they all fall into this family. So if we trace that tree back, um, they, all, they all sort of fall into this cluster. And then all the strains that are in the beer two group, and interestingly enough, also some of the kvikes and uh, land race yeasts, um, fall into this group. So we thought that was really interesting because even though Kvike is genetically closer to these guys, the beer ones, that it's perhaps possible that that mysterious ancestry may have given it more enhanced aromatic traits that makes it look uh, more like or behave more like some of these more aromatic yeasts, even though it's non-phenolic. Um, that's sort of a key difference. It doesn't have that phenolic spiciness that the Belgian yeasts do. Um, it still looks similar, like to the point where, you know, if you look at Hornendal versus Ardennes and see how closely related they are, it's almost like Hornendal is, is a non-phenolic Ardennes, um, in a lot of ways. Uh, we thought that was really interesting because that's not what we'd expect. We'd expect the bikes to just be something like more flavor active versions of these. And, and that's not what, what this ended up looking like, but it's really cool to us to see, um, that line up so neatly, right? We have our beer two family over here, our Belgian yeasts. Uh, and then we have our beer one family over here, our, our uh, clean ale strains, uh, Kolsch strains, uh, American strains, British strains, um, and see that reproduced pretty well in uh, when we actually put those strains to the test in miniature fermentations. So that was pretty cool. That gives us hope for the future that if if we uh, go and then we start sequencing some of these yeasts and getting the genetic data that we can really pull out some meaningful stuff. We can try to understand what uh, what genes or what genetic mutations might lead to more of those uh, fatty acid esters that give us those tropical fruit aromas. And then if we understand how it's made, then we might be able to enhance it or breed for it in the future and help you guys make uh, really cool fruity beers with with uh, with new yeasts. So in general, the answer is yes, we actually can cluster the yeast according to groups. Of course, when we get into sort of the low level details, we see that there are some exceptions to those rules.
then another question we wanted to ask um, was, was how, what does the flavor map look like? Like if we take all of these different traits of the yeast, like all of the aromas, uh, fermentation rate, acids, things like that, we try to um, sort of plug that into a, to a map that tells us, you know, which strain is closest to which strain, which is, you know, what, are, what, what does the neighborhood look like? Um, we're, we're sort of curious about that because we were also questioning like, which strains are you know sort of average or generic um that maybe aren't very distinct from each other but then also which strains are sort of out in no man's land um that may have interesting combinations of traits um that may we may want to explore in the future because you know one of our goals is to give brewers access to a, a wider range of flavors um so so this is sort of maybe a useful technique for that So we were able to do this. Um, it's using a technique that's called principal component analysis. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details of this, but essentially what we can do is we can take all of that data and make just a, a two dimensional map. So we can see these, these yeast neighborhoods. We can see that um, in this case, all of our British strains are, are mostly clustering together with some exceptions like this English ale two over here. Um, our Saison strains are mostly over here. Obviously there's overlap because a lot of these yeasts are closely related to each other or or have similar uh, properties, right? Uh, we see, you know, most of our lager strains are over here on the left-hand side, um, more neutral um, and, and, and also very, very similar to each other. And we see that play out um, in this map. To me, this is an easier way to understand um, the relationship between, uh, between these strains uh, in terms of their flavor profiles than like that big heat map, but um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And then some of the interesting stuff was seeing these outliers, right? If we see Ringwood, English 2, Farm Stand stays on, uh, Ontario Farmhouse Wild Thing, sort of out here, that, that signals to us that these yeasts might, might be offering something unique, right? And that there's a lot of space that's not being filled as well. Like, what happens if we were to take the English Ale 2 and breed that with the Farm Stand stays on? Would we get something completely new? So this allows us to sort of filter out some of the noise and be a little bit more strategic about um, trying to find new flavor combinations or even or even trying to create new yeasts in the future. So we're not just sort of guessing blindly. We, we sort of have have a map, right? And, and if this is the area that hasn't been explored, then maybe we need to explore it. Um, so that's really exciting to me um, because, you know, I, I'm just like you guys, I'm always chasing, you know, the next the next interesting or or, or uh, hot yeast flavor and uh, trying to stay on the cutting edge of this stuff. So in conclusion, we learned a lot about our yeasts. Um, this makes it, this kind of study makes it so much easier for us to give advice because finally, if someone emails me and says, hey, I really want a yeast to make a lot of glycerol and I want it to have a lot of pineapple ester, I can say, okay, we did this study here's the strain for you, right? We're able to say that confidently using some of the data that we have at hand. Uh, we're gonna be using this in the future. Uh, we've got a website um, in the works that we're gonna be launching soon um, that's gonna have a lot more information about the strains um, right on there because we do often have people um, that ask us for information and it's easier for us to just present it in an easily digested way on the, on the website so that you guys can get that without having to um, ask us um it's always easier just to offer all those details um we'll try to have a catalog in the future as well and then moving forward we can also sequence those yeasts and try to predict their behavior so now that we know how some of them behave we can also combine genetic information with with some of this beer fermentation information and try to really understand what makes the yeast tick and um a be able to help brewers um, dial in their beers with these existing strains, but also um, this can help us to design new strains and new and uh, new blends in the future as well. So what's next? Uh, we want to do some good yeast hunting. Um, we want to look for patterns and correlations in the data. We want to get new insights about how beer yeast works. You know, we we really took it honestly a top level view of, of this project because we looked at a lot of individual traits a lot of the cool stuff uh emerges even more when you start to look at correlations between these things and that um there might be new insights here and and surprising correlations right like you know we may ask the question does the ivu reduction actually correlate to the flocculation of the yeast or is there something else going on here with them we don't really know the answer to that 
but this kind of um, study can help us to really understand how the beer yeasts work and ultimately help brewers to make better beer. Um, that's really the goal here. Um, no matter how, how, how far we get into the weeds with, uh, with the data, you know, the end goal is, is making tasty beer because, um, you know, that's what we're all about. So see, we have a bunch of questions and I also see that I need to invite, uh, Nate Ferguson back in here. So I'm going to do that right now. I also want to thank everyone for, uh, for listening in and, and I hope that this was useful and, uh, uh, I hope that you can use some of this insight to uh, make make tasty beer in the future. Awesome, thanks, Richard. Um, I moved, moved myself from the chat so we were less obstructed less less obstructed to the uh, the window. Um, we do have a handful of questions, and I've gone through a bunch of them already. Um, there are a few that we we're going to save for a later session, just because they do require a bit more information. But the first one I want us to kind of top on touch on is the one that has by far the most votes. Uh, could you please touch on pitch rates and cell counts for Kvike strains? How much is too much, too little, and its effect on flavor? Also, is there any difference in generation, generation mutations compared to other traditional North American Saccharomyces strains? We have a, you wrote a paper on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we're <laughs> equipped to answer that question, Nate. Um, Spencer, cool, man. Um, we did, uh, back in November, we, we published a blog post um, we're uh, detailing a study that we did to to test quike pitch rates because that's something that that I think was talked about quite a lot is is that um, you can pitch these things at like one tenth of the normal yeast pitch rate and they ferment fine um, and in fact that's what's traditional in Norway um, so that was really interesting because like that that shouldn't work that shouldn't make sense right you know we have yeast pitch rates and 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 you know there's a reason they exist because if you go outside those bounds bad things happen. But then when you do it with Kvike, uh, it's fine. Um, so it we did, all the rules. <laughs> yeah, so actually like part of, part of this study was actually another study where we tested Kvike pitch rates, like within nested within this study was like, was another study. So we sort of did like studyception here um, and looked at yeast uh, Kvike pitch rates um, with four different uh, Kvike blends and um, going anywhere from one tenth to to the full pitch rate basically and um that information is up on our blog we did share it at the the master brewers conference in october um in calgary as well so that's i guess sort of where it was published um and the answer is that it it matters for some of the strains but not for others um in terms of fermentation rate the higher pitch rates did ferment faster but it wasn't really a huge difference um in terms of flavor we did see that with the Hornendal and Voss, uh, with lower pitch rates, they did produce uh, more of the volatile aroma compounds. Um, but then the other two that we tested, which is the Ebergarden and the Arset, um, there wasn't really uh, much trend there. So it, it may even depend on the strains themselves. Um, when it comes to our practical recommendations for Kvike pitching, we usually suggest people go kind of split the difference, like go somewhere in the middle. Like you can pitch lower, but also if you're pitching at Seven million cells per mil. That that's almost always appropriate. Yep. Yeah, I got nothing else to add on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll keep this going. So this next question is can kind of be summarized by: What are your thoughts on open fermenting kvike? If you can, I would try it. Um, and how is it different from non-open fermented? I did do an experiment um, probably about a year ago, um, just sort of at the homebrew scale with like the 20 liter chronicle fermenters um where one of them was uh was open fermented and one of them was was closed um i don't think we got any analytical data on that but um the open fermented one was a little bit fruitier and did ferment a little bit faster um so if you can open ferment with like i would try it because i have seen some positive results and in, in, um in terms of the the traditional context none of these guys have closed fermenters it's a you know some kind of open vessel right so uh, the yeast <laughs> is probably pretty pretty happy in that environment yeah it's probably probably used to ferment it in uh, blue plastic drums <laughs> yeah that's that, that's the that's the farmhouse brewing technology of the day now yeah for, yep. for sure those are everywhere um the next highest rated question uh, and this is this is a little bit of a 
topic for us to carry on. Um, we have a non-diastatic saison yeast, which we'll be, we'll be talking about diastatic yeast cells a bit more in depth during our uh, webinar conference a few weeks from now. Um, I believe it's then. Uh, we have a non-diastatic saison yeast. Can you tell us a bit about it and how, how it's different from the non-diastatic ones? Saison maison. Um, <clears throat> yep. I mean, the main re the main uh, thing that makes it different from the other saison strains is that it is not diastatic. It doesn't have the STA1 gene. Um, so that's, that's a pretty key difference with that one. Um, in terms of flavor, I, I guess we did get into some of that here, um, in, in this, the study, um, in, in terms of the saison yeast across the board, there was quite a lot of diversity in terms of flavors. So, um, in general, that one seems to sort of, in most cases, land somewhere in the middle, um, as compared to the other saison strains where, for example, like the. The, the Saccharomyces and the New World blend is very neutral, and then the um, farm stand saison is like very um, aroma active. So yeah, very expressive. I would, I, would, I would say it's. I'm not going to say like generic saison, but it's like you taste a beer with with the saison maison. And you're like, yep, that's a saison. Yep. The only the only <laughs> thing I would, I would comment about the saison maison is because it's non diastatic, your chance of that beer under attenuating is higher. So you yeah. really have to do things to crank out the attenuation. Like you have to mash at sacrification temps for like 90 minutes to an hour. Like you need to hot, like ferment that guy hot. Like some, some people are, are fermenting that strain in the thirties. Like, like how you'd handle, handle a Kavike there. It's, it's very weird. It's very odd. Yeah. Yeah. We had the best results from pitching at like 30 and then, um, toward the tail end of the fermentation dosing and, um, amyloglucosidase enzyme. Like, like you, like basically like you would for like a brute IPA, like take that same approach and like, yeah, as long yeah. as you have a small amount of the enzyme there's not really any risk of the enzyme itself causing any cr cross contamination issues. Yeah. There's a handful of breweries that don't do that though. It's, it's not, it's not required. It just, it really does. If you're looking for that dry Saison characteristic, it's a nice way to replicate it without an STA one contaminating organism in your brewery. Yeah. Um, we kind of answer this next one, but do we ever find that astringency is yeast dependent? I have found this, but that's oh, probably yeah. also associated with the IBU portion we talked about as well. Yeah. So one of my dreams is to reproduce this study and and do sensory. Yeah. Um, but the the sheer number of of man hours required to accomplish that in terms of you know whenever we do a sensory panel, it's eight people, right? Um, if you need to assemble eight people to taste 53, 56, 57 beers in triplicate and do the sensory sessions in duplicate, it's a lot. The, the, and, and the beers have to be ready at the same time. It, it's it's almost impossible. So we need to do some, some thought into that. But I, I would love to do that. We have, for example, uh, tested multiple lactobacillus strains and found mm -hmm. um, noticeable differences in astringency with those. So I expect we would see... Um, differences in, in, in astringency um, between yeast, but measuring astringency is best done by tongues and not by uh, machines like like the GC. Yeah, we, the, we, we do have some plans, you know, in the future for a bit more in-depth analysis, things like that, but that's uh, probably a couple of years away. Um, we got we have plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we got about, you know, a few more minutes for a handful of more questions. There's a few more rapid fire. There are a few I'm going to start skipping, though, just because there's one here on Brett that we have. We're going to talk about Brett more in depth at a later point. So we're going to we're going to move that later yeah. on. So those that want to hear about Brett, just just remain patient. Be like Brett. You know, <laughs> Brett, Brett had all the patience in the world. We're gonna we're gonna get to all of it. Is um, in a in a Brett focused session. So the next question is about mixed color fermentations with Saccharomyces only. So when you co pitch the yeast at, at least sorry uh, at least estery and or POF positive ones. Is it expected that both or all the yeast make a flavor impact, even if pitched in unequal amounts? So th this is this is I call, like we we can talk about this a lot. <laughs> I, I'm really hoping to to uh, to have some 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 hard data on that presented in in the Brett session that we have coming up. Um, this, is, this is just Saccharomyces strains, not Brett. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So okay. I mean, the question. I, I mean, I interpret the question as being, does the primary strain matter? Right. And mm -hmm. it seems intuitive that it wouldn't because Brett does so much, but um, 
there is some 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 data that's still sort of under wraps that 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 counters that 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 that, that, there, that the the primary strain does have um, some impact on the flavor profile, although it's still fairly poorly understood. Yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah, don't don't just throw any 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 sack strain at a Brett ferment. You you can combine sack and Brett strains and, and get some interesting results. But but recognize yeah. that like Brett will eliminate some of the flavors from the Saccharomyces. Like it'll it'll eliminate the acetate esters, like the banana kind of thing. It'll convert the phenols into other phenols. So it will it will change things. Uh, I the question's more so focused on sacri Saccharomyces Saccharomyces mixed cultures. So like things like an old world saison blend and things like oh, that. Oh so, okay. So you when you so sorry when you say mixed culture, I just my mind I know threat. Sorry. I know. Uh, so it, Typically what you okay. see is diff different strains are different levels of aggressiveness. So the most aggressive strain, the one that's the fastest to kind of get to the food, typically is the one that survived. So you don't typically see the flavor co the flavor compounds produced by the blend to be reproducible from batch to batch to batch. Yeah, that's that's tough. That's something we've seen too, even with our own blends, like the Old World Saison blend. Um, wish it were more stable, but one of the strains does tend to outcompete. Um, and so we're, we're trying to learn a lot of lessons from the Kvikes now because you can blend Kvikes and they'll stay stable for generations and upon generations. So if we can learn how they do it, then we can make, make other blends uh, stable as well. And those strains from those blends, they're all relatively the same level of aggressiveness. Like we don't have one mm -hmm. that ferments incredibly aggressively, another one that doesn't. Like they're, they're, there's a lot more in depth on that, which we will probably get into at a later point. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to skip the question about mashing because I feel like we'll talk about that at a later point. Um, I want your thoughts on this, Roger, because I think we'll have different opinions on this one. Uh, what, which one of your Belgian strains do you carry? Would you recommend for both a Belgian dark and strong and Belgian golden strong, and why? Those are such different styles. Like in, my, I don't know. In my mind, those are such different styles. That's actually a tough question. Oh, I have uh, an easy answer on this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think my inclination would be probably man the golden strong. That's 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 <laughs> wild card because like there's like Saint Lucifer is like the best for that style, but like it's kind of a one trick pony, and it's kind of horrific to work with. Yeah, and then like my, the, dark, my... the dark strong, you can go in a totally different different direction. You can go to like the malt maltier um, fruitier strains. Yeah. So my my inclination on both of these, I think Nick is the one who answered asked this question, mm -hmm. um, is be dry Belgian, hands down, left, right, and center for both. Um, and the yeah. reason for it is that one of the biggest issues with both these strains is under attenuation. So both these beer styles is under attenuation. Like no one likes a super, like a, a sweeter version of either of these beers. It's, it's not something you're typically ever striving for. And that strain is aggressive. Like I've seen that beer ferment up to, I think 16 or 17% alcohol. Like it's aggressive and it did it really quickly. Uh, we also know, and you saw that in the data today that it's not a very high fusel alcohol producer. It's very aggressive. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to really watch your, what the composition of your malt bill is. Like if you add a lot of Munich grains or even some crystal malts, that dark and strong is going to be great. If you use all Pilsner malt and some sugar, that, that golden strong is going to be there. The only thing you have to be worried about, and this is something that I, I'm always somewhat hesitant when it comes to the golden, sorry, the dry Belgian str the strain is that it is probably one of the most diastatic organisms in existence, at least one of the ones that we have. And that has a lot of operational problems. If you, like if you're a saison, or sorry, not a saison. If you're a diastatic only brewery, it's phenomenal. But if you want to have anything else in that facility, I would probably recommend Ardennes if you ha if you don't want that. If you don't want that risk associated with it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say if if you don't want to use it, like I think Dry Belgian is a great recommendation. If you don't want to use a diastatic strain, I would say um, the next best for those applications would probably be the West Abbey Ale strain. Yeah, uh, I guess it's pretty easy to figure out what brewery that's from <laughs> <laughs> um great great for for dark strongs very much uh and and pretty good for for golden strongs as well yeah there's a few questions in here or uh, one question here about contamination but i feel like we'll have a contamination lecture at some point so we're gonna we'll kind of leave it there uh what are our thoughts on dosing calcium carbonate into the into the fv to control ph um i don't think it's a great idea i think in most cases um like even just speaking from experience with my own my own home brewing, um, 
just just knowing um, that sort of pH drop for each strain has really helped me to dial in the beers that I'm making and, and hit those targets um, to the point where, you know, just by knowing that gap, I, I can pick a, uh, I, I can determine what my wort pH should be. And so I can make all those pH adjustments um, while, while wort production is happening. So pretty much just using the, <laughs> on one end, the natural alkalinity of our lovely Guelph water. And on the other end, yeah. uh, lactic acid and, and getting to that, to that target point, to the point where for me anyway, like post ferment adjustments have not been necessary. I, I do know that that is, that is an option as well. So I have heard of some people, um, adjusting, um, especially loggers that sort of have too much of that acidic twang. I have heard of people using, yep. um, using, um, bases like that just as a quick fix to adjust the pH. And it, uh, I haven't tried it. I, apparently it is somewhat effective. I've, I've tried it and it kind of falls apart as far as I'm concerned because the human palate senses pH, but we taste TA. And that's a, a, a lecture on how the human palate functions is a whole, whole other topic <laughs> that we need to talk. That's best suited for another, another one. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to kind of finish up because we have you know a few minutes left. Um, we're going to do a few kind of quick rapid fire ones. Uh, so temperature fluctuation during fermentation, how tight do you think it should be? I'd say about 0.5 to 1 degree C in either direction, but Yep. Yep. I mean, I'm in, I'm in two worlds, you know, I make, I make saisons and, and I don't care whatsoever about temperature control for those beers. And then on the other hand, I, I make lagers and lager like beers and I want those to be within one C of, of the yep. set point at all times. So it kind of depends on the beer. Yep. Um, there's a question here about pH values and dry hopping, but I think that's something we'll talk about at a later point. Um, are we going to publish this data in the near future? Uh, I think we have to wait for your university a little bit on that, don't we? Yeah, there's sort of a few, a few, a few more things in the works. Um, there's there's an even more complicated version of this in the works um, with some more controls and and more more equipment, uh, which is which is cool. Um, in terms of this, yeah, this study. Um, I mean, the main purpose was really to enforce, uh, sort sort to inform. Um, us so that we can help our customers more but yeah there is a potential to to share it um especially as we start to dive into um the data and and pull out some of these these interesting insights it's just you know the question is like what do we do i i remember having this conversation with with is who was sort of the the, the lead of the study and you know saying like i i there's there's too much here for for a paper really like i'm not really sure how to condense this and you know her response was oh you should write a book uh, so maybe, maybe we'll write a book one day. I don't know. <laughs> um, th there's a, there's a lot here and a, and a lot of interesting stuff. So I do want to make sure that it is shared, um, as wi as widely as, as we can, you know, keeping in mind some of the limitations of the study, like the, you know, the small size of the fermenters and things like that. Yeah. And, and a few kind of follow up questions on, on the experiment itself. Um, how, how well did we control for the amount of yeast per millimeter worked for degree Plato? Yeah, so the pitching rate, the, the pitching rate was controlled. Yeah, um, did we do we aerate all the samples before fermentation? Yeah, so they were aerated to atmospheric levels through shaking, essentially. So that that's okay. what we could do when we're when we're when we're working with like a uh, two liter bottle of wort. Uh, did we adjust for sorry? Did we account sorry measure TA in any of the samples? Titratable acidity. No, way, no. Means. So pH was measured and, and acetic acid was measured. Um, I mean, yeah, if you could go into that data and pull out other acids as well. They, most of the other ones were not really present in, in quantities that were significantly large. Um, so I imagine a lot of the, the pH contribution in this case is the acetic acid. There may be, the yeast does make other acids like succinic acid, malic acid, um, all of these things that fly off of the the citric acid cycle which i think you talked about in yeast basic yep. um so, oh, so no, there, I, didn't, I, I don't think we did actually okay, okay. <laughs> there are there are like other acids that can you know basically be produced as byproducts of metabolism that may contribute to that as well um but i think having the acetic acid values and the and the and the ph would uh goes a long way in explaining some of those differences 
And we'll kind of keep this last one as the final one. It's, it was a, it's a quick one. Was biomass tracked for any of these samples? And as a follow-up, what, what, what things do you want to, if we were to redo this again, what things do you want to add? So I'm guessing the question, I, I'm guessing the question is about biomass at the end, like how yes. much biomass was made by the yeasts. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did we did do cell counts at the end because um, we were looking at viability um, just to make sure that that like the yeast didn't crap out or like die and and that influenced the results. So um, we do have that. We haven't really um, we, we haven't done a dive into that data um, in the context of of actual biomass production. That'd be interesting because you know yep. it's sort of a general rule that if you pitch yeast at the standard rate into a ferment, you get you know four or five times that much out, but you know that might be strain dependent and so yeah we, we can definitely take take another look at that at that data through that lens absolutely um, if i were to do this again i would i would love to explore temperature like i would love to do 18 c and 25 c and look at the impact that the temperature has on these strains and i saw some of the questions in the yeast basics about you know specific strains like what temperature do I ferment Ardennes at? And, and, you know, right now I don't have a super clear answer to that, but that kind of study would allow us to provide that answer. Yeah. Um, so like, that's the big thing for me is understanding like what, what impact does temperature have on these yeasts? There's a lot of general rules and a lot of stuff that we've talked about, but it, again, it, it hasn't all been put to the test with ale yeasts and that's like a huge knowledge gap right now. So um, <laughs> I, I really understand the impact of temperature would be, would be interesting to me. Yep, I, I totally agree on that. I, I yeah, I want to know temperature and like, aeration rates. So you, you could we could make this experiment as complicated or as simple as we want it. Every single time we get more, no more. Mm -hmm. I, I have this answered probably forty questions I have, and I have one hundred and twenty to replace it. <laughs> yep. Well, that that's always the case with science, right? Is like you know you know you've done okay science if you've got more questions than answers, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think we'll keep it there. There are a few sample questions in there that we're going to save for probably another Q and A at some point, uh, probably after the uh, the webinar conference. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll cut it there. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed tonight and got a lot of useful information out of this. If you have any questions, let us know. We'll uh, we'll tabulate them and keep them for the next Q and A, and we'll hopefully see you guys, all you guys next Thursday. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, just one last thing. Yep. Someone asked what I'm drinking. It's the Reverse Wilson. From Short Finger <laughs> Brewing in collaboration with uh, Will, Will from our own team, um, the greatest mustache at Escarpment Labs. Uh, so tasty, tasty little beer. Yeah, and if you uh, if you find yourself in the Kitchener Waterloo Guelph area, go go support your local homebrew store. Short Fingers is a is wonder, wonderful place. All right, cheers. Yeah, cheers, Thanks, everyone. Good night. Stay safe.